بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Today, with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa taala, we'll be starting Kitab al-Siyam, the book pertaining to matters of fasting from the book written by Imam Ibn Qudama al-Maqtasi rahimahullah taala, known as Umdat al-Fiqh. Taking this book, uh, it's a beginner's level book, as we know those who have been following from the beginning. And the important thing that I always try to remind the students and the people studying is that ensure that you understand what the Imam is saying. This is the key objective, to understand what the Imam is saying and to review those notes and to ensure that you understand his opinion. Because in the beginning stages of fiqh where we are, we build upon one Imam's opinion. And we take our journey through that one Imam building step by step as we go along. The extra information I give you, if you can understand it and develop with it, then that is well and good. But whenever I test you, when, whenever I expect you to remember something and understand something, it's from the text itself. So the matters pertaining to fiqh of fasting is how it's going to be. Understand what the Imam is saying, memorize what the Imam is saying, and you should be well on your journey to understanding fiqh to a decent level by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in any case, Kitab al-Siyam. Psalm and Siyam, linguistically, the linguistic meaning in the language, has the meaning of imsak. Imsak meaning to refrain from, to refrain from something. For example, Maryam alayhi salam is quoted as saying in the Quran, إِنِّي نَذَرْتُ لِرَحْمَانِ سَوْمَ فَلَنْ أُكَلِّمَ الْيَوْمَ insiya. Today, verily, I have vowed to Allah to make sawm. So I will not speak to anybody. What did she refrain from? She refrained from speaking. Thus, it was termed as sawm. It was termed as fasting. Not the fasting that we understand, but the linguistic meaning of fasting. That is the linguistic meaning of fasting. The technical definition, istilahan, technical definition is imsak maqsus an ashai maqsusa fi waqtin maqsus min shakhsin maqsus. Imsak maqsus, a specific withholding. Imsak maqsus an ashai maqsusa from specific things. Fi waqtin maqsus in a specific time, min shakhsin maqsus, from a specific person. So we have four parts of the definition. Okay? The first of it was what? Imsak maqsus, a specific withholding, a spe- specific fasting. What is that? What does that mean? Excellent. Ahsant. For Ramadan, this withholding is for the fasting of Ramadan. Okay? An ashai maqsusa from specific things. What are those specific things? Al-Mufattarat, anything which breaks your fast, okay? From the most common of them is the food and the drink, okay? Fi waqtin maqsus, in a specific time, the time from the, uh, from the morning, from before the sun rises, to the time of the setting of the sun, to maghrib, okay? Min shakhsin maqsus, from a specific person. From a sane Muslim. There's more to it, but that's the general basic understanding. So we'll take this definition bit by bit as the Imam explains it, okay? <coughs> the fasting was made obligatory in the second year of Hijrah of the Prophet. ﷺ, okay, the second year of the Hijrah of the Prophet. ﷺ. It came in three stages. Okay, fasting was obligated or became obligatory in three stages. What was the first of them? What was the first thing which was made obligatory in fasting? Psalm, Yawm al-Ashura. The fasting of the Yawm al-Ashura. Okay, that was the first fast that was ever made obligatory upon the Muslims. Okay. Thumma nusikhat. Then Nasq was made of the fast of Yawm al-Ashura. And then Ramadan became obligatory. Ma'a takhir. Ramadan became obligatory with takhir. Takhir choice meaning you could either fast Ramadan or if you didn't want to fast, you could pay for every day that you didn't fast to feed a poor person. <coughs> you could pay for every day instead of fasting to feed a poor person, right? This was the second stage. The third stage, this was repealed as a, as a ruling and Ramadan became obligatory and remained obligatory till the end of time. 
and also those who cannot fast due to a valid reason like the elderly and the, those who are sick continually they continue to pay for every day they do not fast to feed a poor person okay so it became obligatory in those three stages the imam he says ramadan and it's obligatory obligatory to fast ramadan because allah says in the quran in surah al-baqarah كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الصِّيَامِ كَمَا كُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ In Surah Al-Baqarah, كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الصِّيَامِ كُتِبَ in the Quran means it has become obligatory upon you. So fasting is obligatory upon you, like it was those before you, perhaps, or in the hope that you will gain taqwa. And also in the hadith of Ibn Umar, رضي الله عنه, the Prophet said, بُنِّيَ الْإِسْلَامُ وَلَا خَمْسِ شَهَادَةِ أَنْ لَا إِلَهِ إِلَى الله وَأَنَّ مُحَمَّدَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ وَإِقَامَ الصَّلَاةِ وَإِتَاءِ الزَّكَاةِ وَحَجِّ الْبَيْتِ وَصَوْمِ رَمَضَانِ That these five things, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that Islam is built upon. And from them, he mentioned the fasting of Ramadan. Okay, the five pillars. And the fifth of them he mentioned was the fasting of Ramadan. So Ramadan is something which is well understood. It's to be obligatory. You have to fast this month. طيب. The word Ramadan... The word itself Ramadan comes from the word Ramad, Ramad, Ra Mim Da, Ramad, okay? The, the, the Arabs when they were naming the months, they looked upon the month of Ramadan and it was, it was found to be in the time when it was extremely hot. So they named it from the heat of the ground, the heat of the stones on the ground, which is Ramad, okay? So it, get, it had the meaning of Ramadan. Also Ramadan, a group of scholars, they say you shouldn't say Ramadan. They say you should always say Shahru Ramadan. And there's a narration collected by Imam Bayhaqi that alludes to this. That do not say Ramadan, rather say Shahru Ramadan. But this narration collected by Imam Bayhaqi is weak. And you will find as we go through the chapter that there are many authentic narrations where the Prophet ﷺ mentioned Ramadan as it is, without mentioning the word the month, without mentioning Shahr. So you do not have to say Shahr Ramadan, you can mention Ramadan standing alone as it is. طيب. So the Imam, he says, it's jajib, it's obligatory. Ala kulli Muslim, upon everyone who is a Muslim. If somebody was to become Muslim in one of the days of Ramadan after the sun has set, what is upon them to do? Somebody comes a Muslim now in the month of Ramadan after Maghrib. What does he have to do? He has to continue the remainder of the month as the Muslims do, fasting it. If somebody becomes a Muslim during the day of Ramadan, one of the days of Ramadan, what does he have to do? From that day onwards, huh? Notice that's the same as the first situation, if you answer it like this. So somebody becomes a Muslim during the day of Ramadan, before Ramadan, what does he have to do? He has to make imsak for the rest of the day. So say for example, he became Muslim at one o'clock, he has to make imsak, he has to withhold from the food and drink and everything which breaks the fast for the rest of the day and he has to make that day up as well as continuing to fast the rest of the month. Okay, this is the opinion of the majority of the ulama. The Shafi and the Maliki scholars as well as Ibn Taymiyyah, they said that this person who became a Muslim in part of the day of Ramadan, that day itself, he doesn't have to make imsak. Why? He doesn't have to make him sack, they say, because Imam uh, Ibn Abi Shayba in his Musannaf, he has a narration from Abdullah ibn Masudin radiallahu anhu, the great scholar of the companions, who said, Man akhla awwal al nahar, falyakhul akhirahu. Whoever ate during the beginning of the day, then let him continue to eat during the latter part of the day. Meaning, that if you had a valid excuse not to be fasting in the beginning of the day, then you can continue with that excuse till the end of the day, right? So you broke, you didn't have fasting in the beginning of the day, you do not have to have fasting at the end of the day. This is their uh, opinion on that matter. So the Imam, he said, it's obligatory upon all Muslims. Now he's going to describe which type of Muslim, right? Baligh and Aqil. These are the first conditions for it to be obligatory upon you. You have to be Baligh and you have to be Aqil. You have to be Baligh and Aqil. This is found in the hadith collected by Imam Ibn Majah where the Prophet ﷺ is narrated to have said, have said, رُفِعَ الْقَلَمْ عَنِ الثَّلَاثِ The pen of responsibility is lifted upon three groups of people. And in Naim حَتَّى يستيقظ. From the one who is sleeping until he wakes up. وَعَنِ الصَّغِيرِ حَتَّى يَكْبُرْ And from the one who is young until he becomes old. 
and from the one who is insane until he regains his sanity. So this hadith it shows to us that if you do not reach the age of balugh, then there is no obligation upon you. Okay? So the Imam he says you have to be balugh and you have to be aqil. You also have to have your sanity about you. So the hadith it mentioned three people that if you fall into those categories, fasting is not upon you. From them was mentioned the one who is small, not reached puberty. And from them was mentioned the one who doesn't have his faculties about him. طيب, the Imam, he said, بالغ, meaning reaches the age of maturity. In Islam, how do you reach the age of maturity? What are the factors by it which it's known that a person has reached the age of maturity now? That somebody becomes بالغ. The age of 15 years old, I can't raise your voice a bit more. If you have pubic hair, okay. I can't hear you, brother, sorry. If you have inzal al money, if you excrete semen, and the fourth one is for specifically to the women, if they menstruate, if they experience menstruation. So it doesn't mean that you have to have all of these, it means whichever one comes first. Whichever one of these three come first and four for the women, then you would consider that the person has reached the age of balugh, the age of responsibility, and fasting would be obligatory upon that person. So the Imam, he says, these are the conditions. And then he goes on to add another conditions. He said, qadir ala sawm, that the person has the ability to fast. What does this mean? Huh? The person is not extremely sick. And what else? The person is not traveling. And what else? Anything which may, may prevent the person from fasting. Maybe the person has an extremely difficult job. If the person has a, an extremely difficult job, like he's a builder, he has to work outside during the hot hours in the summer. Now, most of these people, it would be extremely difficult for them to fast. So what do they do in this situation? They start the day of fasting. They have the intention to fast. And if during the day they find that it's too difficult for them, they are allowed to break their fast and they can make up their fast later. Okay, so the Imam he says another condition is that the person is actually able to fast. طيب. We're going to explain that a bit further. The Imam he says that the young child who has not reached the age of puberty is commanded to fast if he is able or she is able to do so. So though the person is not an adult, they are still commanded to fast. Okay, why do you think? Training, ahsant. Because this is how the believers are supposed to behave with their children. That we understand that the purpose of us being on this earth, we did not create mankind or jinn except to worship Allah alone. If that be the case, then we don't leave these important matters until the person has become an adult. If you leave it so late, you will find that the person at the age of 20 trying to practice the religion will find it difficult. But if from an early age you train them not to play PlayStation, but you train them to grow up on the religion and obedient to Allah they will find for the rest of their lives it's easy for them. And they will have good foundations and good knowledge. And you find that in every society, that which is important to that society, whether it's Muslim or non-Muslim, they train their children upon those issues from an early age, from those ethics and those morals from an early age. So we as Muslims should never shy away from doing the same. From an early age, we train our children to understand what their role in life is, what their purpose in life is, who Allah Azawajal is, who Muhammad Sallallahu is, what they should believe, and how they should worship Allah Azawajal. From an early age, this is extremely important. And in fact, Sheikh Abdullah ibn Jibreen, Rahimullah Ta'ala, he said that the person who doesn't do this, who doesn't train his child to fast, etc., is a sinful person. Okay? So it's extremely important. So he said, you command your children to do so if they are able to do so. The fasting of the month is obligatory with one of three things. So first he mentioned to us upon who it's obligatory. Now he's going to mention when is it obligatory. Okay, So it becomes obligatory in the time period by one of three things. He mentions Kamal Shaban, the completion of the month before it, the month of Shaban. Because the Prophet ﷺ said in Bukhari and Muslim, as collected, as narrated by Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu, the Prophet ﷺ said, Sumu li ru'yatihi. Fast when you see the moon. Wa li ru'yatihi. And break the fast when you see the moon. Fa'in ghubiya alaykum. And if it's 
covered from you, hidden from you the moon, then complete the duration of the month of Sha'ban 30. Okay? So the Imam, he said to us, it's obligatory to fast when one of three things happens. The first of them he mentioned, that you complete Sha'ban. What is the completion of Sha'ban according to this hadith that we just mentioned? 30 days, right? 30 days, the Prophet ﷺ said. You complete Sha'ban 30 days, right? The next thing the Imam, he says, or you see the month, you see the, um, the moon of Ramadan, okay? And we mentioned this in the hadith just now, that the Prophet ﷺ said, if you see the moon, fast. If you see the moon, break the fast, meaning the end of the month. If you did not see so, then complete the month before it of Sha'ban to be 30 days. The ru'ya, ru'ya means the sighting, which is mu'tabar. Mu'tabar means that which is accepted and uh, officiated. A ru'ya al-mu'tabar is the one which is seen after Maghrib, not if it is seen before Maghrib. If it is seen before Maghrib as it can happen, at times you can see the full moon, right? You can see the moon of the next month. Then that is not considered. The, the sighting which is considered is the sighting which is after Maghrib. This is the ru'ya al-mu'tabar. The Imam, he says, So this is the third thing he's going to mention now. First he mentioned by the sighting of the moon. Uh, sorry, first he mentioned by the 30 days of Sha'ban or the sighting of the moon. Now he's going to mention a third thing, okay? And this situation is peculiar to the Hanbali scholars, okay? It's peculiar, meaning specific to the madhab of the Hanbali scholars. They say, If on the 30th night, okay, the night comes before the day, right? In, in uh, the Islamic uh, terminology. So if on the 30th night, there is a cloudy sky, or there is heavy rain, or there is a dust storm, or anything of that sort, which is blocking your view from you being able to see the moon on the 30th night, what do they say here? Then they say, you have to fast it, okay? So another reason for you to start the fasting, is if it's a cloudy night or a night of that type, a dusty night, which is blocking you from being able to view the moon which may possibly be there on the 30th of the night of Sha'ban. They say here, you have to fast it. Why do you fast it? In the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ, in Bukhari and Muslim, he said, إِذَا رَأَيْتُمُهُ فَصُومُوا وَإِذَا رَأَيْتُمُهُ فَأَفْتِرُوا فَإِنْ غُمَّ عَلَيْكُمْ the Prophet ﷺ said in Bukhari a Muslim, if you see the moon, then fast. Okay? And if you see the moon at the end of the month, break the fast. But if it's hidden from you, like it's due to clouds, etc., then make an estimation of it. Make an estimation of it, right? Got me so far? The hadith says make an estimation of it. In Surah uh, at talaq Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَنْ قُدِرَ عَلَيْهِ رِزْقَهُ فَلْيُنْفِقْ مِمَّا آتَاهُ اللَّهُ وَمَنْ قُدِرَ From the same word, فَقْدِرُ وَمَنْ قُدِرَ عَلَيْهِ رِزْقَهُ Whoever's rizq is قُدِر upon him, and قُدِر in this verse means whoever's rizq is made narrow upon him, ضَيِّق upon him, right? Then he should spend from what he is able to do. So the ulama of the Hanbali scholars, they looked at this meaning. They said Allah is using the same verb qudr to mean uh, constrained. So when we understand the hadith that I just mentioned, the word is used, faqdiru lahu, right? Qadr, they say we're going to constrain it, which means we're going to make the month, okay? We're going to make the month 29 days. So the 30th, which, which is the one which was hidden by the clouds, etc., we're going to make that as a day that we should fast. Okay? Because the Prophet ﷺ said, فَقْدِرُوا لَهُ He used the word فَقْدِرُوا and according to the verse in the Quran that we mentioned, it can have the meaning of making it constrained. So we're going to constrain the month, make it 29 days, and the 30th day, we're going to fast احتياطن, out of possibility that the moon was seen. At the possibility that the Ramadan, the month of Ramadan, had started because we couldn't see the moon due to the clouding or due to the dust storm, etc., the moon couldn't be seen. So we're going to make taqdeer of it. And we're going to fast ihtiyatan. So these are the three things when the month of Ramadan will start for you. The first of them was the completion of 
Sha'ban, 30 days. The second of them was to see the moon. The third of them was if you could not see the moon on the 30th night, you make taqdeer, meaning that the next day you fast ihtiyatan. You fast out of a possibility that this is the first day of Ramadan. Tayyib. The majority of the ulama, they say, no, you don't do this. So the Hanbali scholars, they say, this is what you do, according uh, as well as our Imam. They say that if it's the night where you couldn't see the moon, the next day you fast out of possibility, right? The majority, they say no, because they say this hadith that we are talking about, where the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that you make taqdeer, you make estimation, and the Hanbali understood it to be narrowing it. They say, no, we go back to the other hadith, which I mentioned before in Bukhari and Muslim, where Abu Hurair radiallahu anhu, he said at the end of the hadith, uh, if it's hidden from you, meaning the moon, then you complete the month of Sha'ban 30. So they say here, the Prophet ﷺ specifically said to complete the month of Sha'ban 30 days, right? So the majority, they say, we're not going to do this fasting, fasting out of possibility. We're going to complete the month of Sha'ban 30 days. And also they have the hadith of uh, Ammar ibn Yasir, radiyallahu anhu, which is in Tirmidhi, where the Prophet ﷺ said, or he said, that the Prophet ﷺ said, uh, The person who fasts the day in which people are doubtful about, meaning the 30th, that where they didn't see the moon, they're doubtful about this. Whoever fasts that day, then he has disobeyed Abu Qasim. So this hadith is in Tirmidhi, right? And also they have another hadith where the Prophet ﷺ said in Tirmidhi, with the Prophet Sallallahu said in Bukhari and Muslim narrated by Abu Huraira, لا تقدم رمضان بصوم يوم ولا يومين إلا رجل كان يصوم صوما فليصومه. In this hadith in Bukhari and Muslim narrated by Abu Huraira, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, do not proceed Ramadan with fasting with a day or a two. Meaning before Ramadan starts, do not fast before Ramadan by a day or two, okay, except for a person who used to habitually fast those days. Right? then that person should fast that day. Meaning that if you've got a habitual fast of, of fasting one day, and then the next day you don't fast, and it happens to be that a day before Ramadan, your fast falls on that day, you can fast that day. But otherwise, you shouldn't do so. So this hadith, as well as the others, refutes what the Hanbali scholar said, and refutes what our Imam says, according to the majority of the ulama. Though we respect both opinions. And for us, we are taking the opinion of Imam Ibn Qudama, right? Because we are learning from his book. The extra information is for you to benefit from if you can do so. Otherwise, you're going to stick to the opinion of Imam Ibn Qadama. The Imam, he says, وَإِذَا رَأَى الْهِلَالِ وَحْدَهُ صام. If a person sees the moon by himself, then he is too fast. If the person sees the moon by himself, then he is too fast. And this is the opinion of the majority of the ulama. Okay? Because they say, in the Quran, whoever from amongst you Surah Al-Baqarah sees the moon, then he should go ahead and fast. They say the verse is general. So it means even one person. If a person sees the moon, he should go ahead and fast. But this can be a bit chaotic, right? One person thinks he's seen the moon, he fasts. Another person thinks he saw it on another day, he fasts on a different day. So it becomes a bit chaotic within the same family, within the same community. Anyway, the other opinion is the opinion held by Ibn Taymiyyah and others who say in the hadith of Tirmidhi, where the Prophet ﷺ said, Asawm yawma tasumun, wal fitr yawma tuftarun, wal adha yawma tudahun. In Tirmidhi, the Prophet ﷺ said, the sawm, the fasting, is the day when all of you fast, meaning as communal, as a collective commun communal obligation, as a community. And the, um, the breaking of the fast is the day when you all break the fast. And the adha, the day you slaughter, the Eid al-Adha is the day when you all slaughter. So the Prophet ﷺ linked the fasting upon a communal issue, upon a communal sighting. Okay? So this is the opinion of Ibn Taymiyyah and those who hold that opinion with him, right? The majority of the ulama, they said that if you see the moon by yourself, then you go ahead and fast. Okay? And this, our Imam also holds that opinion. Ibn Taymiyyah, according to this hadith, has a very strong opinion, which is that no, you only do it when the community does it. Okay? You only do it when the community does it. Tayyib. What about in our situation where we live in these Muslim countries? Will we come across this situation? 
that a person fasts by himself. We won't come across this situation, alhamdulillah. And that is the beauty of living under, even though it's not real Sharia rule, it's remnants of Sharia rule, but it's still beautiful. It removes a lot of the uh, infighting and the bickering that can take place. Why? Because the government is an established body. They have the Wazarat al awqaf who is responsible for the Islamic affairs. They tell us when to fast, we go ahead and fast based upon what they tell us to do. And that is something which is uh, well accepted amongst the scholars, right? It removes the differences of opinions and the differences that can occur. The Imam says, فَإِن كَانَ عَدْلًا صَامَ النَّاسِ بِقَوْلِهِ If the person who sees the moon is adlan, meaning he is a person known to be just, a person, a person known to be just, this word adl, when it comes to fasting, it's more than just. It means that the person was able also to sight the moon. So not only is he just and truth, uh, truth worthy, trustworthy, it means that he has good eyesight, right? He can actually see the moon. So if this person happened to see the moon, then his, uh, his um, testimony should be accepted. It shouldn't be rejected, okay? His testimony should be accepted. If one person sees the moon and he reports it to the government, to the governmental body, then they should accept his testimony, right? As long as he's trustworthy, a Muslim, and he was able to, and he has the ability to see the moon. In Abi Dawood, collected by Imam Abi Dawood, Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu, he said, The people, they went out to look for the moon, to see if they could see it. فَرَأَيْتُهُ So I saw it. فَأَقْبَدْتُ النَّبِي صلى الله عليه وسلم فَصَامَهُ I told the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم that I saw the moon. So he went ahead and he fasted based upon my sighting of the moon. وَأَمَرَ النَّاسِ بِصِيَامِهِ And he commanded the people to fast based upon my sighting. So this shows what the Imam is saying, that if the one person sees the fast, the, sees the moon, and he's trustworthy, he reports it, then that report should be accepted. All other months in Ramadan, they are not established to have started except with two witnesses. Ramadan is the acceptance, the exception. All other months, Islamic months, they are not established to have entered unless two people see the moon. Ramadan is the only exception that allows for one person to see the moon, okay? And many of the ulama, they said it doesn't have to be a male, okay? It doesn't have to be male. Some of the Hanbali scholars, the, Han the Hanafi scholars and others, they said that a woman's testimony is taken in this situation also for sighting of the moon. <clears throat> the Imam, he says, that the people should fast based upon his sighting. What does it mean, the people? Does it mean the people of his locality or does it mean the people of the world? There's two opinions, right? The majority of the ulama, they said, in fact, it means the whole of the world. Anybody throughout the world, once it's sighted in one part of the world, then they have to go ahead and they have to fast according to that one sighting. Okay? This is the opinion of the majority of the ulama. Ibn Taymiyyah and the Shafi'i scholars, they hold that if the sighting, if the... Um, what's the wording for it? If the time zones are similar, they share the same time zone, right? They share the same matla, but I don't know how to say that in, uh, or to explain that. I think the closest understanding to, standing to it is the time zone, maybe. They share the night, okay. Possible, yeah. They share the time zone of the night and the day, right? They share the same matla of the, of the qamar, right? If they share the same time zone, then according to Ibn Taymiyyah and uh, Imam Shafi, then these people are to fast with the sighting of that one fasting. The majority, they say, the whole of the world fasts upon the one sighting. Ibn Taymiyyah and Imam Shafi, they said it's for those who share the same matla, okay? The, sh the same time zone. Um, Sheikh uh, Hamad al Hamad, in his explanation of Zad al Mustaqni, he said, Look, he said this issue is something which people argue about day and night when it comes to a few months before Ramadan or a few weeks before Ramadan. He said this shouldn't be the case, okay? He said there's a lot of room, as we've seen, for difference of opinion in this issue. You shouldn't spend so much time dividing over this issue, okay? If you're in a situation, go with the majority, okay? If you're in a country where you don't have the legal uh, representation deciding for you when the moon sighting is, then go with the majority of your locality. Try not to stray away from the majority so that you don't have these uh, huge differences of opinion. The Imam says, وَلَا يُفْتِرُوا إِلَّا بِشَهَادَةِ عَدْلَيْنِ and you do not break the fasting, meaning you do not end the month of Ramadan 
unless you have two. We said every month apart from Ramadan, for it to be established to have started, requires two witnesses, okay? So Imam Ibn, uh, Iman, Imam Ibn Abd al-Bar, Rahimullah Ta'ala, the great Maliki scholar, in his book Tamheed, this, he said there's ijma' upon this. Okay, all of the ulama across all the madhahib are agreed that every month is not established unless it has two witnesses except for the month of Ramadan. Tayyip. وَلَا يُفْطِرُوا إِلَّا بِشِهَادَةِ adlain. So you don't break the fasting unless two people see the next month. وَلَا يُفْطِرُوا إِذَا رَآهُ وَحْدَهُ And you do not do so if you see it by yourself. وَإِنْ صَامُوا بِشِهَادَةِ اثْنَيْنْ ثَلَثِينْ يَوْمًا أَفْطِرُوا أَفْطِرُوا and if they fasted the month with the sighting of two people, 30 days, okay, then you finish the month. If two people or more say that the month has been, the, the month has ended due to the sighting of the next moon, uh, of the, sorry, not of the next moon, of 30 days of fasting, then the fasting has finished, okay? When in Psalm of Shahadith, it's named 13 Yawman of Aftiru. Yeah, what he's saying here, if that you see the next month, if it's two witnesses, then you consider the month has been finished, right? The moon of the next month, Shawwal, has been seen by two witnesses or more, then the month has been considered to be finished. And if it's due to one person sighting, or it's due to the cloudiness, cloudy nature of the sky, you couldn't see the moon, then you don't stop fasting. What do you do in that situation? You don't stop fasting, Unless you see the moon, oh, you kumilul idda, oh, you complete the idda, the duration. What is the duration here? 31 days, right? Because you fasted one day out of doubt in the beginning of Ramadan. And 30 days, if you didn't see the moon, you have to fast 30 days, okay? The idda of the month of Ramadan. So 31, it will end up being, if you hold the opinion that our Imam is holding, that the first day is fasted the day of doubt, okay? But if you don't hold that opinion according to the majority, then it will be 30. Otherwise, 31. Tayyip. There is another situation where you can end up fasting more than 30 days, even if you don't hold the opinion of the humbly scholars. Right? Say, for example, you travel from this country where they start the month of Ramadan on a particular day. You go to another country, they started the day after you. Right? So you end up fasting 30 days. What do you do in the situation that they have one day left? The Prophet ﷺ said, al sawm yawma tasumun, that fasting is the day when you all fast. Wal fitr yawma tuftarun, and the fitr, the breaking of the fast, is the day when you all break the fast, meaning the Eid. So according to this opinion, okay, Shaykh Uthaymin says that you can end up fasting 31 days. You can end up fasting what? 31 days, right? Because you went to a country which started fasting after you. What do you do in the reverse situation? You started late, right? You start after them. So they're going to have Eid a day before you have left. What do you do in that situation? You still have one day fasting to go. They're going to break their fast, 29 fasts. 29 fasts, they celebrate Eid. You've done 28 because you started a day later, right? What do you do in that situation? But what do you do with the Eid? You celebrate that Eid with them, very good, and you make up the day, okay? You make up the day with them, inshallah. Tayyip, the Imam, he says, Bab ahkam al mufattirin fi Ramadan. The chapter now pertaining to those who are exempt from fasting in Ramadan. Okay, the chapter pertaining to those who are exempt from fasting in Ramadan. He says, Wa yubahul fitr fi Ramadan li arbati aqsam. And it's permitted, yubah is permissible, for fitr, meaning not to fast, for four types of people. Now pay attention to this word that he mentioned, yubah. Okay, he didn't say it's obligatory. He said yubah, it's permitted, right? We need to remember that a few pages down. He says it's permitted for four categories of people in Ramadan not to fast. Ahaduha al marid One of them is the sick person. Alladhi yatadarru bihi. The sick person who if he fasts, then the fasting will increase him in sickness or it will delay his recovery. So one of those two will take place. If you are sick to the extent that if you were to fast and it increases you in your sickness, or it will delay your recovery, then it's allowed for you not to fast. Tayyip. Imam Ahmed, he said even, he was asked that a person has a fever. Uh, is this a person 
allowed to break his fast. Imam Ahmad said there is nothing more difficult than a fever. Meaning that even if you have a fever, if you're in a situation of having a fever, you are allowed to break your fast. But if it's something which is as simple as a little cut on your finger or a headache, then this type of illness doesn't equate that you should uh, break the fast or not fast, right? right? Rather, it's a person who is sick, genuinely sick, then this person, he doesn't have to fast. And this is mentioned in the Quran also. وَمَنْ كَانَ مَرِيدًا أَوْ أَعْلَى سَفْرٍ Whoever is sick or upon a journey, then he can make up days later, right? In Surah Al-Baqarah. So if a person is sick in the sense that it's going to increase his sickness by fasting, or it's going to delay his recovery, then the person, he doesn't have to fast. وَالْمُسَافِرْ أَلَّذِي لَهُ الْقَصْرِ The second person who is permitted to break the fasting or not to fast is the one who is traveling. Is it anybody who's traveling? What are the considerations here? If you take that opinion, according to the earth, right? Whatever you consider to be uh, traveling, then that is traveling. But the majority of the ulama and what we've been taking, according to the imam, 80 kilometers, right? So if you're a distance of more than 80 kilometers, then that is a considered to be you uh, being upon a journey. So if you're on a journey which is more than 80 kilometers, going to be more than 80 kilometers, then you can break your fast. And that can only take place if or once you've left the bunyan of your city, once you've left the boundaries of your city, then you can break your fast, not before that, right? The third thing, the third consideration, is that it shouldn't be a journey for ma'asiyah. It shouldn't be a sinful journey. The ruqsa is not given for the one who is on a sinful journey, right? These are some of the considerations that must be there. So it should be 80 kilometers or more, and the person shouldn't intend to stay in his destination for four or more days, for more than four days. If the person tend, intends to stay at the destination for more than four days, then he's not availed the uh, ruqsa, the concessions of the traveler. So the person who is on a journey of more than 80 kilometers, he is allowed to, for example, uh, shorten his prayers, he is allowed not to fast. But if your journey means that you're going to go to a place, and when you get to that place, you intend to stay there for more than four days, once you reach that place, you are not allowed to avail for yourself the concessions of the traveler okay it's only for the person who intends to stay less than four days if you end up staying more than four days out of not out of your choice meaning something held you back from returning then you can uh, continue to avail the concessions as long as it takes you to return because you didn't intend to stay for more than four days right but the one who intends to stay for more than four days then he cannot avail the concessions uh, upon himself so Allah says in the Quran, فَمَنْ كَانَ مِنْكُمْ مَرِيدًا أَوْ عَلَىٰ سَفْرٍ فَإِدَّةٌ مِنْ أَيَّامِ الْأُخْرِ So those of you who are sick or upon a journey, then they can fast other days than the days of their sickness or the days of their journey. But, so we said the person can avail himself the concession. And the evidence for that, apart from the Quran, is the hadith of Hamza al-Aslami in Sahil Muslim, where he said, Ya Rasulullah, ajidu fi nafsi quwwatan ala sawm fi safar. He said, O Prophet of Allah, I find in myself the strength and the ability to fast whilst traveling. Fahal alayya junah. So is there any sin upon me? The Prophet said, Hiya ruqsatun min Allah. It is a concession from Allah. Faman akhada biha fahasan. So the one who takes that concession, then well and good. Woman ahabba an yasum fala junaha alayhi. But the one who wishes to fast, in the journey, then there is no harm upon him. Okay? There's no harm upon him. But the Hanbali scholars, they said it's better, rather they said it's in, incumbent upon the person that even if it's not difficult upon him, then he should not fast. He should take the ruqsa. Because in the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said in Bukhari and Muslim, Laysa min al bir as-sawm fi safar. It's not from righteousness to fast whilst on a journey. What did the Prophet say? It's not from bir, it's not from goodness or righteousness to fast while on a journey. So the humbly scholars based upon this hadith, they said that the person, he should never fast while on a journey. The other scholars, the majority, they have a reply to this hadith. From the hadith itself, does anybody know? What is the reply to the hadith? Ahsan, jazakallah khair, may Allah open goodness for you. The hadith is actually talking about somebody the Prophet ﷺ came across who was fainted. He had passed out due to the suffering of fasting while on the journey. Okay? So the hadith is pertaining to that particular situation. 
If it brings you difficulty where it's going to harm you, then it's not from birr, then it's not from goodness. If it's not that situation, then you can go to the hadith of Hamza al-Aslami that we mentioned in Sahih Muslim where the Prophet ﷺ said, if you find the ability to fast, then there's nothing upon you. There's no harm upon you. There's no sin upon you. So the choice is up to the person, right? The majority of the ulama, they said, which one is better? Is it better for the person to take the ruqsa or not take the ruqsa? Meaning you have the choice, right? You have the choice that you don't have to fast or you should fast or you can fast. But which one is better for you? Should I take the choice not to fast? There's no sin upon me. Or should I go ahead and fast without harming myself? There's no sin upon me. Which one is better for me? Because it's easier for you to fast with the people. Fasting with the people is easier than fasting alone. And also, if you fast after the month of Ramadan, you miss out on the virtues of fasting in the month of Ramadan, even though you were excused, right? So it's better to fast if you are able to do so. If a person starts the journey after the Fajr prayer, then the majority of the ulama, the Hanafi, the Shafi, and the Maliki scholars, they say he is not allowed to break his fast. Okay? So halfway through the day, you, you found that you had to go on a journey, right? You had to take a, a flight somewhere. So they say, the majority, that you cannot now break your fast. Why? Because they, they said that part of the act of worship was done whilst you were a resident. And part of it is going to be done whilst you are a traveler. So the ruling is given to the part whilst you are a resident. Okay, this is their ta'lil. This is their reasoning. Okay, this is their reasoning. The other scholars, they say no. They say no, the fact that Allah says that if you are upon a journey, then you can break your fast. This is am. This is general. And whenever you find yourself upon a journey, then you can go ahead and break your fast. Tayyib. The Imam, he says, the Imam he said to break the person's fast is better for them. This is the opinion of the Hanbali scholars. And for, upon the person who breaks his fast when he's traveling, he only has to make qadha. But if he decides to fast, then his fasting will be valid. Okay? If he decides to fast, his fasting will be valid. A third, the Imam he mentions the third category. Al-Mufattireen, the people who are allowed not to fast in Ramadan. We said there's four categories, right? The third of them, and we'll stop here. He said, Al-Ha'id wa Nufasa, Taftirani wa Taqdiyani. The Ha'id, the one who is experiencing menstrual, uh, menstrual bleeding, or the Nufasa, the postnatal bleeding. These two, it's allowed for them not to fast. Remember a few moments ago, I said to you that be careful of the wording of the Imam. He said, Yubah. Al-Fitr li arba'ati aqsam. It's permitted for four categories of people to break their fast, right? But what do you find here? Because some ulama they took task with his wording. Because here the ha'id, the ha'id is the menstruating woman. Is she allowed to fast? She's not allowed to fast under any situation, right? So they said his wording here, Yubah, the Imam, may Allah have mercy upon him and raise his status in Jannah. They said his wording here that he should have chose a, chosen a different wording. Not say Yubah. He shouldn't have put the, the woman who's menstruating under this category. Because the woman who's menstruating is not permissible for her to fast. Okay? Because we have in the hadith in Sahih Muslim, Mu'adha, she said, I asked Aisha radiallahu anha, ma balu al-ha'id taqdi sawm wa la taqdi salah. What is the situation of the menstruating woman that she makes up the fasting and she doesn't make up the prayer? So in this, this hadith is proving what? That the... Uh, the the fasting for the menstruating woman, it cannot be, she cannot fast. Because this woman is asking Aisha radiallahu anha, the scholar, ما بال الحائد تقضي الصوم ولا تقضي الصلاة What is the situation of the woman that she has to make up the fasting, but she doesn't have to make up the salah? So the, the Aisha radiallahu anha in the, end of, in the end of the hadith, she said, كَانَ يُصِيبُنَا ذَلِكْ فَنُؤْمَرُوا بِقَضَاءِ الصَّوْمِ وَلَا نُؤْمَرُوا بِقَضَاءِ الصَّلَاةِ She said that used to happen to us in the time of the Prophet وسلم, meaning we used to menstruate, and the Prophet وسلم, would tell us not to fast, make it up later, but we didn't have to make up the prayers that we didn't pray. So the one who is menstruating, she's not allowed to fast. طيب, some points pertaining to the menstruating woman. The woman whose blood stops after Fajr is not allowed to fast because there's no way she could have the intention to fast, right? They agree the ulama that if the woman becomes pure even if 10 seconds before the Fajr Adhan, then it's allowed for her to fast. Meaning that if her blood stops, even if it be a few moments before the Fajr Adhan, then it's allowed for her to fast. But they differ 
over how long it should be. The Hanafi scholars, they said that it should be a long enough period for her to make ghusl. The period before when she stops her bleeding and fajr should have been long enough for her to have made ghusl, right? But the majority, they said, this is not the case. Why do you think the majority said it's not the case? I'll quote to you the hadith. The hadith in Sahih Muslim with the Prophet ﷺ is narrated, كَانَ النَّبِي صَلَى اللَّهِ وَسَلَّمْ يُسْبِحُ جُنَّبًا مِنْ غَيْرِ حُلْمٍ ثُمَّ يَسُومْ The Prophet ﷺ used to get up in the morning, okay, junub, in a state of janaba, and it wasn't due to wet dream, meaning he had relationship with his family, and then he would go ahead and he would fast. So what do we understand from the hadith as a, as a reply to the Hanafi scholars who said that there must be enough time for this woman to have made ghusl before fajr. We understand that purity of janabah is not a condition because the Prophet ﷺ, when he fasted, according to this hadith, he didn't have purity of janabah, of, of janab, okay? So menstruation is the same of that, same as that. So if you're in a state of janabah, whether it be for the menstruation or it be to other janabah, okay, then you can still go ahead and fast and you make up, you make the purity before you go and you make, uh, you make the uh, salah. طيب. The Imam he says, وَإِنْ صَامَتَا لَمْ يُدْزِئْهُمَا And if these two people, meaning the one who is uh, experiencing menstruation or postnatal bleeding, they fast, then it's not going to be uh, accepted from them. We'll stop here inshallah and we'll continue with the fourth category of the people who are allowed not to fast inshallah next week. <laughs>